Welcome to the Smart Tech Check Podcast, hosted by Mark Vina, your home for candid, insightful, and provocative conversations about the smart home, home automation, security, smartphones, PC and console gaming, and much more. Hi, my name is Mark Vina, host of the Smart Tech Check Podcast. Today is Thursday, July 28th, 2022. The smart home continues to grow at a vigorous pace as more homeowners are seeking innovative solutions to automate their homes, protect their loved ones, and provide peace of mind. But challenges continue to exist from an ease of use and interoperability standpoint. In addition, we continue to see companies combine forces to maximize their resources and know-how in the smart home. One such company is Nortec Control, who was recently, recently acquired by Nice SPA, a global manufacturer of smart home and building solutions. Nortec Control brands are recognized for their rewarding capabilities in the smart home control audio, security, health, and wellness areas. Joining me for today's uh, podcast, and let me bring him up on the screen, is uh, Paul Williams. Uh, Paul Williams is the CPO, the Chief Product Officer of NICE Nortec Control. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Pleasure to be here. Glad that you're here. We had a couple of issues with uh, technical difficulties, but I think we've overcome them, and I do appreciate your your time today. I'm going to bring up a couple. Of, uh, 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 I'm going to dive deep into a few topics I wanted to um, delve into. But first of all, I always like to go into people's backgrounds because that I think lends a lot more color and flavor to the podcast here. So let me bring up um, a slide on your background, and we're actually going to get into that uh, a bit deeply. But tell us about your role at um, at uh, Nice North Tech Control and about your background and how you got to where you are. You bet. Uh, so current role today, I'm the Chief Product Officer at Nice uh, Nice North America. Is how we're, we'll be changing that too. Um, that. Uh, uh, is a position where it's a fairly new addition to the team, uh, right behind the acquisition of Nice SPA, as you mentioned at the first part of your call. Of the call. So a uh, couple things of that, so prior to my experience here, I was working for uh, GE Lighting. GE Lighting was a uh, savant, is a well-known uh, pro installed yes. solution that competes with our install solution that we have. Uh, so very similar to, to uh, the work that I was doing there for the last couple of spots and GE Lighting. And then prior to that, that uh, was 15 called Control 4, another competitor of both Elon and of, of, of uh, Savant. Uh, two decades in the smart home and smart connected spaces uh, arena of uh, commercial, uh, commercial properties, also to residential properties. So I've seen a lot go. I've seen a lot of things happen. <laughs> yeah. uh, when I first start, started, we didn't even have these mobile devices. This idea that you'd be using it uh, for a conference call, as we are today, to get around the technical difficulty to use it to control your, your home was was uh, 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 kind of a thought of, of wow, that, that would be cool if we are today. Um, um, so right. I've seen a lot happen over the last uh, two decades in the smart home. Uh, prior to that, level positions in... in uh, both tech start startups and then also Fortune 500 companies like Harmo. Big background there, and then audio background that goes along with that. Well, well, it's interesting because there's not many uh, um, gentlemen out there, or, or 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 women for that matter, that really have the kind of you know multi-decade experience in the smart home. And as you know, if you go back to the day, you know, the in the 1990s or maybe the early 2000s. You know, the smart home was very much, it wasn't called smart home. I think the phrase was home automation. It was home automation. And, you know, and, 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 and the reality is it was really for the person who was really committed to figuring out an interesting way and turning on a light. And if they could do that, that was, you know, groundbreaking. And we've obviously come a long way. You know, there's tens of millions of users now that, you know, use their uh, smartphones. We've had the advent, of course, the, um, voice assistants that really have kind of powered this through. And we got more and more people who really want to sign up for smart home capability. Yet there's a lot of challenges that remain in the space. You know, I, I, I'm you now would like would be interesting at your perspective on on this question. The, the, do you really think right now the smart home is a mainstream category? I mean, certainly it's a it's 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 got tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people buying all kinds of devices. Depending on how you define what a smart home is, some some people define that a smart home. Oh, I have an Alexa speaker. And I can turn on a light. I have a smart home. You know, that's pretty 
basic one-on-one type of stuff. But do you really think, where do you think we are right now, if I to use the innings of a baseball game as kind of an analogy? You know, are we in the third inning? Are we in the seventh inning? You know, don't know if you're a baseball fan, but uh, let me, yeah. I just want to get your assessment of that. I, I think it's a great question. It's one of the things that I've, I've pondered a lot as we've moved through, through this secular, uh, uh, where we really saw this influx of, of anything that could be connected was it really, really shouldn't have been connected. Um, we've just connected everything. Um, and uh, I will now, you were probably somewhere in that like third beginning, top of the fourth inning, maybe somewhere in there. Me here. Um, the the thing that I believe where we're at today um, is that we have an early adopter phase. Uh, we have not got to the mass market um, opportunity there about a consumer's journey into this world. And, and to your point, um, I've talked to consumers uh, that you go, do you have a smart home? And they'll say, yes. Okay, well, what do you have? I have, a, I have a Nest thermostat. Okay, it's debatable, <laughs> right? right? Maybe you sort of smart, but uh, it's not really a smart home. That, that you've got, but not a smart home. And the part of the problem is, it has been came up with all, all these devices. We decided we wanted to put them in there. Um, but without a real value prop, it's, it's really hard for you to see. And we've done similar things. Things. Do you want to have a smart home? And like, oh, years, it's fine. It, I, it does everything I need it to do. But until you can start to tell a story about you can get from a smart home or the extra security that a smart home can give you or the extra time you can gain memory, and still you, until you start uncovering these valuable use cases, the consumer don't need that. I, I don't need more complexity in my life. I don't need to add more devices. So re really what we is, are more of these early adopters that are okay with, you know, a little bit of pain. I'm going to have to go try and load some code from some programmer in Azure Bayon that's created some, if it allows me to do some complex scenarios in my home. But we're really starting to get to today that mass adoption curve. And that, that mass adoption curve has, is, is necessary because we've seen started to occur and have been occurring in the industry. We're one of those, right? We're consolidating that from a business perspective, both the technology and the use cases that are consolidating to really start to give value to consumers about why you would want those. For example, a recent, I mean, if we go back, back to the people started getting packages delivered, it was very, became a very big issue with porch pirates, people pack packages off of, off of porches. That, that created this, this suddenly we've got a solution for bells. And suddenly that category like just goes out out of the world because there's a value people consumer can go, I can help protect myself by putting a smart doorbell on the house. And those can continue to pull consumers into the smart home. And that's the evolution pretty early because I don't think we're there yet. We've still got issues around how do we make all these. There's some interesting things coming there in the way of, of yeah. matter. Matter. For example, yes. that has some mm -hmm. we've has some hope for being able to at least bring us to a level where we can bring products in. But I think that's that's only the beginning part of that. Getting things to talk together is is, is an important putting that foundation. But it's really what are the use cases that consumers are going to feel value and invest both, both money and time and resource to, to put these things in my home for me to be able to get that kind of experience. And that's right. where, where we're heading. Well, the interesting thing, and I, I want to dive into your kind of your, your, your journey, you know, because you're a smart home guy. I consider myself a smart home guy. I think it's funny that you brought up the thermostat thing because really, and this goes back now about, I think I bought, had the first generation Nest thermostat. And I, I want to say 2007. Yeah, between you know, 2007 I mean, and that time frame that's why i had yeah. first generation and and, and the reason why i did it chiefly it wasn't really for convenience well it was for convenience purposes but if you live in california as i do in the bay area you now california even though you're going back five, you know five ten fifteen twenty years california has always had high electricity um uh cost and i was getting tired of getting hit with you know three four hundred dollar a month um uh bills and it was purely because I wanted to make sure that when I left my home, if I was 
if I wasn't intelligent enough to turn off the air conditioning, because it does get sometimes gets hot up in San Jose, I don't want to, you know, I, I wanted to see if I can maximize my savings there. Uh, now, of course, the, my place looks is, is night and day there. But the power savings est, uh, um, dimension of the smart home, which I think it was certainly on the, on the map going back, now that's really a value proposition for a lot of people. So anyway, let me turn it back over to you. I want to kind of walk you through your journey, you know, maybe reflecting on your home. I, I imagine you have one hell of a <laughs> smart home. <laughs> that's been my experience. But let's talk a little bit about that. Well, the, the journey for me is been been very interesting um at understanding um you know we as you mentioned when we started out in the very beginning of this it was known as smart uh, or or home automation that we used to say at that point in time was really for the one it was people that had enough money to be able to do because they were expensive to install the equipment was expensive it took to have them installed the professionals that came in literally opened up a laptop they, they opened it like programming code to get your stuff to all work together. Very not, not, not object oriented, not, certainly not drag and drop. It was very much, much line level programming. And so they were very, uh, very fragile. It yes. didn't take very much to, to get them to break. And, and so before we came in with a new approach, which is an object oriented language uh, solution, which was drag and drop it up to a wider, broader range of still Professionally installed, but a wider range of professional programming experience, or don't have any programming staff, and then also brought the cost down as as well, and that started to see more people entering in uh, with that phase. We then then get to the point. Where, in fact, we just got to the 15 year anniversary this last month of the uh, of the iPhone, so it's, it seems like a long time ago. At the same time, uh, but now then when we got to the smartphone suddenly world of, of, of openness to wow we could control our home from a mobile device and so we entered down that same time too and suddenly you had control not of the home just when you were in the home and previously and i could get on a computer at a hard line connection connect to my house and control at that of it, no matter where it was in an airport um down the road uh, on the other side of the planet i set up a control that was at my fingertips and we followed suit as did a lot of other manufacturers following suit and, and then that, that spawns the age of iot and that's where we started to get like, like everything under that connected to toasters connected uh, uh, copy machines everything's connected i the the uh, the thing that kind of that said hey we maybe have jumped the shark here was <laughs> um i love ces i'm so, um, in, in the in the bottom floor of the sand uh, prior to COVID, they would always have, have this. This would be a tree level uh, yes. startup companies, it's like two two people in a garage that decided for the product would show up there. And it was great because you got to see some cool, cool innovative thinking. But you knew that not by the next CES because they just can't find the funding or the idea doesn't work. Um, I think the, the for me is when I then when I went there and they had a tail that you'd clip on the back of your pants and what you were in. And then it would wag the tail based on the mood. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I'm pretty sure I was, was not missing a tail. And secondly, that, that I don't need to broadcast where my emotional feelings are. But we, we, we went to that age. What it did, though, is I think it really started for how, how can we, as platform manufacturers, bring to our system? Because they that's what they are. They're data. They're inputs. They're devices that can trigger things to happen. us data that we then use to then trigger things to happen. And we're still, honestly, starting to get that fine, that finely refined so that we can get, get to where I believe of where, and it gets overused a ton, which is this this aware and an AI, those kind of technologies. But those really do, I think, bring the value. When your you're smart, smart home isn't just smart, because typically what we see see in homes today. It's smart control. I can get in, I can use an app, I can use a, and I can control things in the house. But there are very few things that are hap happening autonomously. It's happened in the house based on history, based on current conditions in the home. That There's very few of those things, but that is where we're headed. And that's the next phase that I see 
that we're going to get to. And that's where we start to get into uh, go up have a beer at the at the seven in the seventh inning stretch, right? So yeah, uh, I, mean, you know, I, I, I think we made a couple of really great points. I mean, first and foremost, I think the smartphone uh, back in two thousand seven when Apple really put that concept on the map has really changed everything because now I have a device now that allows me to do things remotely, not just being at home, but, oh, I, I forgot to turn the lights on. I forgot to turn off the air conditioning. I want to check in on it, what the babysitter is doing. But to your point, you know, the smart home is a bit of a misnomer because I think where the real value is going to come in and call it smart home 3.0 or whatever you, you want to categorize it will be the ability to use AI and your, your past history to, to anticipate things. For example, let's say you have um, a, smart, a smart garage a door opener, you have smart locks, and you fall asleep on the couch and you forget to close the garage door, which is wide open. Yep. The system should be intelligent enough to say, hey, my door is open, it's 10 p.m., the door should be shut, and, it, and maybe to, for double verification, it, it identifies that someone's in the home, shut the garage door, lock the doors, you know? So I, I think the automation in a real-time uh, basis using that kind of AI intelligence is going to be a real, real big deal. Some of that exists today, but not to the degree that you're talking about, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, you can do some of those things today. Um, for our system, people can put a schedule in there that says, hey, if it's 10 p.m. and the door's not open, if the door's open, well, maybe I don't want to sh shut it right now. That's the part that yeah. gets missed from that and that's to your point right? is the becoming aware enough, enough to understand that you're, you're in the house and that because you're in the house they you know i may not want to open it up maybe those things and what i, right. I found is i learned from behaviors that when you're in the house, open you leave it open you're okay so those are the kind of things yes that well that kind of technology can be smart enough that says well you know again just to, to beat a dead horse here is that it could say well it's 10 o'clock at, at night uh, let me check, you know, did you know that the garage door is open? Do you want to close it? You know, and then you could, you know, can double confirm it. But my yep. point is, and I think the point you're, you've made is an excellent one, is that intelligence needs to be real, real and profound. And the capabilities exist. You know, I think the matter initiative, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a couple of moments when we talk about trends. But that's a big deal because, you know, again, the big issue that I think a lot of folks have right now is that a lot of these devices are, are disparate. They don't talk to each other. You know, you have to, you know, when you buy something, your contemplation needs to be, well, does it work with my, my uh, smart home assistant, which most of the time is, is a, if you believe the market share numbers, is either Alexa, followed by Google, you know, HomeKit and Siri, kind of a, you know, a distant third relative to the, to the smart home. And I think Matter, of course, will alleviate a lot of that. But I, the topic I do want to make sure we hit here, because it's a, it's a real important one. Let's talk about the, the acquisition, you know. Uh, the, the motivations behind it. What do you think that um, Nice brings to the table? If I can be that uh, that blunt in terms of the appeal, there seems to be a lot of synergy uh, uh, with this type of acquisition. There's a number of acquisitions that happen in the smart home that uh, in the, in the tech field that you know <laughs> there does tend to be a lot of uh, synergies. And you question yourself, well, why did this happen? Why, why but did they from do your it the first place? Yeah, why did they, exactly. So from your perspective, Paul. You know, give, give, give us some background, inside baseball, I'll uh, use baseball analogy again, on the uh, the motivations and what you think uh, the combination is going to be able to offer users. Yeah, when I saw the, the announcement happen in October, because uh, it made pretty good industry news that it acquired yes. North Tech Control, um, I, I had definitely had my, my ears perk up quite a bit with NICE from before um, and had, had experienced NICE. Nice. Um, will not in North America, but widely known in Europe, in South America, um, realtors in providing uh, intelligent gate control, garage door control, garage door opener, also access control, and, and then had recently, well, as recent as 2018, had acquired a company, a smart home platform company that that you see a lot of there from Poland. You see a lot of those in. in in Europe, and then also a uh, smart shading uh, solution with automated motor for blinds and shades. In fact, those motors get used in in the United States in blinds and shades that many people, they just don't, don't know there's a nice motor inside of it today. So right. the really exciting part about it 
was more tech. It's very purposeful. Um, it's the, the goal, goal of the company is that we, we believe, having been here five months, believe that we can, um, is we believe we we will be the, the smart home platform and, and, and smart spaces platforms. Um, and it's one of those one of those areas of the ability now with what we've got everywhere from the front of the in the road coming in, either you have a gate or not have a gate, where they have a door, don't have a door, where you have a garage door, don't have a garage door. Everything in the ability to be able to not only just control, but we'll have the ability to, to automate and make those things work for the uncovering valuable, uh, value propositions uh, for that consumer that will well want to provide value to them that they they perceive as value so that they any cost they're putting into it they feel and so it's been exciting to to, to be a part of the company um once again uh you know a lot of point but i'll tell you what we've got we've got a lot of, a lot of might and power behind us um and we'll build the night and it'll become synonymous with with the home control right well and, and the interesting thing is you know the smart home is one of those areas that you know, the, the diversity and just the incredible, the sheer number of smart home devices out there from multiple manufacturers, in theory, at a, at a you know, 10,000 foot level, that's great. You know, the consumer has choice. You can find a solution for just about anything today from a camera to a lock, you know, lots of stuff out there. The downside is, is that the amount of complexity that, that provides the consumer with, because you know, t- sometimes too many choices, is not a good thing. And we exactly. have the interoperability uh, issues that we'll talk about in, um, in a moment. But I think this is a particular case that when you have two great companies come together, you know, that to me, there's a lot of benefits that fall out of that because, you know, not one company can possibly cover everything in the smart home. And NICE has, of course, applications and some solutions outside of the realm that Nortec uh, classically participates in. Um, and by the way, we're, we're, we've been focusing a bit on the, uh, the homeowner or the renter. You know, but there's also a multi, an MDU, a multi-dwelling unit opportunity, which you guys play in. Uh, there is the whole, and, and by the way, the research shows over and over again, especially over the last couple of years with the pandemic, more and more people who are renting units, uh, renting homes, they want to see smart home technology in their apartment, in their building. They don't want, they don't want that. They don't, they don't want to, well, I have to buy a home or a condo to enjoy those benefits. I mean, they want to have those capabilities as well. And obviously that's a category that you guys play in uh, very deeply. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And we'll continue to see the MDU uh, re, uh, base. Um, somewhat of necessity, uh, the interest rates and crazy home prices of for being renters. Um, and we'll continue to see that that uh, propagate for some time, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's hit the, the uh, last topic that I want to kind of dive into, and we'll pull it up right there. And you know, at a macro level, some of the trends you know that you see in the smart home space right now. Definitely, one I do want to talk about is en- energy management because I think that has right. always been an opportunity in the um, smart home, but it's now more important than ever where you have people depending on where they live in the country, are suffering brownouts. People, uh, I, I've never met a person who doesn't want to see their electric, electrical bill reduced. That's an opportunity as well. We talked about Matter before, which is an ease of use um, inter- interoperability um, initiative, which I think is making a lot of traction. But from your perspective, what are the top two or three trends that you'd like to focus on? Yeah, the top two or three trends, and you mentioned one, which I believe that, that's one that we'll continue to see uh, grow um, it, it, from necessity. But also, I think you had these rising energy costs. There was certainly an awareness that that people want, wanted to, if part of it, the economical part of it, just because we want to be more green, we want to be more respectful of the planet. That we already a drive towards that. Um, so I honestly, I believe that the smart home technologies need to be able to provide that. Part of it is I need to understand what my consumption looks like today. If, hey, could you go save ten percent less energy? Use- 10% less energy. Most consumers don't even know where to start. We don't even know how, what I, I get the bill at the end of the month and I, I know what I used, but I don't understand how to that usage. So awareness is first part of that. I've got to be able to monitor and understand what parts of my going where. Uh, as you mentioned, thermostat, the, in, in North America, the vast majority of that usage is coming from, uh, from that. But with the move to EVs become one of the rising consumptions of, of 
energy. It's just the reality of what we're doing and pushing around this. Um, and so you'll want to understand what that is. But even more important, both from a, a bit doing that is, it, or measuring it, is what do we do with that now? Okay, so now that I've got that into place and some practice and some of the automation in place to say, you know what? In, in fact, in California, we link, right, that's based on that. And in some areas of the country, it's it's not even based on time of day. It's based on the exact use. As people are using more energy because it's a really hot day, I have to pay more for it, even though I didn't anticipate I was paying. Being able to get that information back from the utility company, can we adjust things? Like, all right, when it goes to high our EV, let's make sure we're not charging the EV. Let's only charge it at night when the rain yes. is low. Let's, yes. let's, make, let's, cut, let's, let's cut off lights, whatever we need to do. But to have that happen automatically, so I don't have to, every time I notice from the utility company, I have to like run around my house and yes. turn things off and on and adjust temperatures. For consumer, I think, is the world that we can get to pretty quickly and are get, getting there right now. Energy management is one of those critical um, use cases that's coming up there. Uh, the next one is secure. It's, it's one of the areas where we'll continue to see growth. Um, we've seen it with, with the smart door, but we'll continue to see that go and I'll extend that into privacy. Um, and yes. people want to make sure that if I've got AI that's out there, I've got stuff that's going on in the cloud, I want to know that my data is secure. I can't see my living habits and my living behaviors or get even access to data that it, that's per That's a big part of what we'll continue to see uh, getting driven there. And then third, I'll mention is health and wellness. Smart home plays very nicely into providing a healthy environment for consumers uh, that in circadian rhythm for lighting control uh, all the way to air quality with, during the area of, era, era of COVID here. We've all become a little more attuned to air house, especially if you have to spend a lot of time in your own home. And so there's some things that are happening there that I think are exciting, the big trends that I see. And in addition to that, um, AI machine learning, uh, those types of, you know, to see happen. In there, but those are the big the big things I see uh, that are occurring from a trend from a use case. Yeah, and and, and I think the one area I think it's just going to be a huge area is smart home appliances. Uh, in that you know you you talk, we keep talking about AI, AI repeatedly during the, the the podcast, but it would be great to have a um, a washer and dryer and a, a dishwasher, which most people use multiple times during the week. That says. Don't, you know, you can fill up dishes in the dishwasher, but don't wash them right now. Wash them at eight o'clock when the rates are 10 or 15% less expensive. Same thing in clothes. Most people don't have to wash their clothes immediately. They can wait to an opt. Uh, yeah, you can wait a little bit. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I see that kind of intelligence capability happening more and more. And by the way, building the, 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 um, the case for the appl smart appliances, because appliances are one of those things that most people don't swap out and change until um, the, the appliance fails. They hold on to a, a washer and dryer and literally until the thing doesn't work anymore. And then they, they don't fix it, they go out and replace it. Um, let, let's end the podcast um, with some commentary though on matter. We talked about it before, you know, how strongly do you guys feel about it as a corporate entity? And uh, are you optimistic that we're gonna see devices, you know, later this year that has um, uh, matter compliance? It's a, it's a great point. Something I've been watching real closely. I've been involved with that process uh, before it was called Connected Home over IP. <laughs> and so involved pretty early on with understanding where, where, is it, where it was. Position to me, um, I was not a fan um, as a man of platforms. Uh, I, I was not a fan. And the reason I was not a fan is it seemed like it was a, a great way of foundational folks. So I won't mention their names, but the, the big three you mentioned earlier. It's great. Great for them. It's an easy, easy, easy way of bringing devices in, and they get all the benefit from it. And and then as equipment advertises me, I, I now have to compete because if everything looks the same, if it all goes on the same, and and that's not that's the race to zero. It's a race I've tried I try to avoid as I where we're heading. I don't, I don't like that race. It's a it's one we'll we'll always potentially lose because there's there's lots of other folks who can do it cheaper. You can get some some person in their garage that decides they're a manufacturer and suddenly so, um i looked at the, at that at the beginning what, what i've come to believe is that 
that it's been because I look at it as a on ramp into a platform and for us because today if I want to bring products in to into a solution um, or out there um, they typically have to hardwire those things in there may be an API but I still can to get that thing to connect to be able to communicate I've added this device in order to communicate to it all the connections and be able to have them talk to each other. And it's it's engineering help. It's, it's engineering work. It moves very, very slowly on being able to bring these new things in. If we can get to a place which at least at that connectivity level where I can say, hey, what, what? this is a, this is a, uh, uh, I'm sensors have the same language that they talk and I know exactly how to talk to it. I can bring those in. I've suddenly now opened actually in the pro install market for our integrators and dealers to be able to use whatever they want to use and bring it up. From an on-ramping perspective, it's great because it's going to allow us to get breadth and depth without having a lot. And where we can focus is where I believe the benefit will be for us and other platform manufacturers. I also don't permit the end of this race. There there will not be. But um, what I believe it brings to us is that ability form. Rather than having to worry about doing it, how do I get all these devices to talk to me and talk to them? The best possible platform and experience for our consumers and if that's where our energy is put then matter in my in my mind has great benefit now as to the timing they keep getting pushed out there are products that are today on the market that are may uh, that have been shipping and are shipping right now so i'm confident we will get there this year first part of next year i i actually don't think it matters that much Matt, to overuse matter important that it that it, it's there there is enough impetus enough drive behind it it will happen i think it does does have an impact on our industry and it's something we are watching as an organization we're staying included. uh we'll we'll continue to to move in that move in that direction so i think there is value in no i, I think that's a fair assessment i think we've been kind of in a, in a kind of a waiting for godot moment i'm using all that's an old theater reference but yeah most exactly. people are already just will understand that reference uh but i you know the one thing i will make uh just a closing observation here is that i think that there is well you know anytime you have competitors on a on a standards body you you got to believe there's there's going to be infighting and you know you, you've been around long enough that you, a lot of these initiatives the the, uh, the the rank and file work very well together the senior levels of management start to kind of duke it out, you know, how do we, we're going to lose di differentiation if we do this and, you know, yada, 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 so to speak, to invoke my, my inner Seinfeld. But I, I do think this time around, I think the most of the, the, most of them, all of the big hitter companies on the consortium realize that there's be, there's more to gain by pushing this thing through and that you're n you'll never get to mainstream acceptance of the smart home unless these basic blocking and tackling things happen. You know, if I have to go into a Best Buy and spend 20 minutes trying to figure out if this smart light works with Google or with Alexa or with um, or HomeKit, it's a lost battle, you know, because there's, most people are not like you and I in terms of, you know, willing to undergo the technical, um, you know, requirements of installing a smart home. I mean, it's certainly easier today than it was back in the day in the late 90s, early 2000s. But it's still um, uh, it, it's uh, still a bit of uh, there's still a bit of complexity and guys like uh, the, the like you guys Nortech and uh, this acquisition um, uh, with uh, Nice I think it's going to yield big benefits so I do appreciate your time and thank you for participating today for today's podcast Paul thanks again for your time for our viewing and listening audience thanks for making the Smart Tech Podcast part of your day of commute please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons at the end of today's podcast. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Mark Vina Tech Guy. And until next time, have a great week. And Paul, thanks again.